And of course, this evening, I want to extend a particularly uh, warm welcome to uh, Cherry Kutu, our guest uh, speaker, but also to the 250 people that you can't see uh, in our audience, 250 people, uh, I'm told, far and wide, uh, who are joining us via a live uh, video stream. I've just been trying to I, I don't think she's gone now, but I've just been trying to explain to Virginia Bottomley what a video stream is. Um, but, I, but I'm going to send her one tomorrow with a big button on it saying push here, and uh, we'll see. Um, she would understand that joke. Um, the Health Foundation um, is committed simply to uh, better health and health care for the, uh, the UK, and I mean the whole of the UK. Um, and under the leadership of uh, Jennifer Dixon, our excellent chief executive, um, I think it's developing very fast at the moment uh, as a forward-thinking, uh, dynamic organisation uh, where fresh thinking is, uh, is taking place. And if fresh thinking leads to new and successful ideas, many of them initiated uh, by staff in the Health Foundation, but many, many more initiated by uh, Health Foundation uh, grant holders uh, working uh, mainly on the front line of the NHS, uh, then the challenge becomes one of scaling up, of ensuring uh, that good ideas, successful ideas are effectively disseminated on the one hand and adopted uh, in uh, practice. Uh, and this is where our special uh, guest uh, comes in. So the Health Foundation is focused simply on three things. Um, improving health service delivery, uh, the effectiveness of health uh, policy making, uh, and indeed increasingly uh, obsessed by the relationship between the two, but also uh, the promotion of a healthier population. So to explain a little more about this and to introduce our guest speaker, I'm going to hand over to Jennifer. But uh, you're all very welcome. Thank you for coming. Thanks very much, Alan. It's a bit disconcerting because the last time I think I was in this room was watching a very bad Italian art house cinema uh, <laughs> film in the early 1990s. So uh, I, I'm hopefully that those ghosts will be banished by by this evening. But um, but thank you, Alan. Uh, you set the scene. Um, I just want to say a little bit more about the Health Foundation because, as some of you know. What we're trying to do really is to try to bridge uh, service with policy, with practice and policy together. Uh, and that's really, really, I think, our bottom line sort of um, modus operandum for the next few years. And what we do, some of you know this, is that we obviously give grants to help people on the ground make changes through innovation, scaling up awards and directed programmes. Uh, in all aspects of quality. Uh, we also give uh, funds out for research and analysis, and we also um, work a lot to fund individuals and networks to build capability by giving PhD grants out, by giving uh, money for fellowships, of which we have several, and also trying to support various networks that are trying to improve healthcare. So this is... Um, totality of, of a, a lot of our work. But I think one of the things we're most interested in is obviously how to make change across the health and healthcare system. And uh, it, it's very interesting. Lots of people have very different theories of change. And so much of our assumptions about change are simply not um, made explicit. Um, what we notice in much of our work is that we fund quite a lot of innovations, but they, some really do spread, but most don't. And I think this is why we were really interested in having Sherry's observations tonight, coming from another sector, uh, other sectors, business outside of healthcare, to work out, are there some lessons from outside that we can learn about how to scale up and spread many more of our innovations and ideas? 
And that's all I really wanted to say by way of introduction, uh, other than to say to thank you very much for, for Sherry for coming. Sherry, as you can see from the biography, which I won't read out, is, has a very long and distinguished history in business and in academe outside of healthcare. She's also currently on the board of the London Stock Exchange, amongst many other things. And she also set up the interestingly named Scaling Up Institute, which I hope she might say a few words all about. And um, more pertinently, she was the author of a recent report for government called Scaling Up, which is about how to scale up per small and medium-sized enterprises. So I really think there's, uh, I can think of no one better to help us with this journey in the National Health Service uh, than, than, than Sherry, who I'm going to ask for, to speak for about 20 minutes and then we'll have some Q&A afterwards. So thank you, Sherry. Thank you very much, and thank you, thank you for having me here. I'm delighted to be here. And apologies for not being an insider. I, I, I'm sure I'm utterly naive in some of the some of the suggestions that I'm, I'm going to have. Let's see if this works. Um, I'm going to start a little bit with a little bit of background, um, and then I'm going to talk about some case studies from other industries that may be useful. Um, and then I'm going to dip into the report that um, that was just spoken about, and then have some provocations or crazy ideas, perhaps, on some of the things that you might think think about um, doing. Um, so I think I just said that. Um, so the voice you hear is a Canadian one, and we're sometimes sensitive about that. So I just thought we'll get that out of the way right away. Um, and I originally came here just about uh, 30 years ago uh, to go to the London School of Economics, which was great. Uh, and I, my first degree was in politics. My second was in econometrics. Um, so of course, I became a computer programmer for my first job, which makes a great deal of sense. Um, but it, it actually made sense to me at the time, and it was a good thing to have done. I then I went off and I studied business. I joined my first startup in 94, 95. I founded a second startup, um, both of them in financial services. My first startup um, used technology in an innovative way, um, and it cost 1 80th of the amount to cr create the same outcomes. Um, I was quite, I don't know, uh, we charged the same amount, but the cost to us of producing the outcome was a lot less. Um, the second company um, used clever technology again, and the cost was very, very low. And instead of charging the same amount as the incumbent, we made it for free. Um, and it was seen as highly, um, highly disruptive at the time, but also highly innovative. Um, after that, um, they were sold, and I started up other ones. And then I went portfolio about 16 years ago, and it all got very messy. But if you were to clump it together, there were some things that I did around policy. Um, there are some uh, things, Nesta, we were talking about Nesta, became a trustee of Nesta, very interested in innovation and what you needed to do once you made something work to get it rapidly into a lot of other countries. Um, both of the companies that I started up were software companies. Once you made it right for one user type, we wanted to get it in a lot of different countries. Um, I've spent quite a bit of time as an angel investor, and there are 55 companies I've made investments in, and there are 600 million people using the software um, that has come out of the investments that I've made every month, which is kind of cool, actually, when you think about it. Um, I've done some investing, board of some things that are getting at culture of innovation in the UK. Um, I've tried being an academic. It's very hard being an academic, actually. Um, so I sort of was an adjunct at, at, at LBS. And I'm on the non-exec uh, director of both Cambridge Assessment and CUP, which are sort of publishing, academic publishing. Um, and I do quite a lot of stuff in Cambridge. Uh, and I've got some big boards that, that I play around with as well. So all of that big mess, which is what happens when you have a portfolio, um, has a lot to do with the adoption of innovation over a long period of time. And I wanted to talk about, in the olden days, mainframes, it took a long time for something that was innovative to be adopted. Um, but you see faster and faster and faster adoption rates happen over time um, as time goes by. And that's because the more you can prove that it has something to do with business productivity, the faster the adoption rates are. Um, and I just want to show this with some real examples of uh, 
other industries where that has taken place. So um, the green line is the telephone, fairly slow adoption rate because it's quite hard, quite hard to get the adoption used in this. There are lots of barriers in the system that prevent it from being uh, instantly adopted. Um, and up here, you can sort of see on the internet an even faster um, sort of the Facebook. Um, you see applications that are on your phone, very easy, free to use, and they produce productivity for the people that use them. Um, and that is what's new. You can see it even across a single technology. I don't know if anybody here has ever used Uber. Hands up, ever used Uber? Anyone? OK, great. Um, so um, this shows rest of world cities and how long from the day it was introduced to when 95% of the population was using it. And this shows the initial earlier cities elsewhere in the world. Let's say it's New York, Boston, <laughs> Paris. Um, what this shows is in China, the software is getting better and better and better because they're making it simpler and simpler and simpler. Um, and when you get a lot of people using it, it uh, you see the adoption curves going straight up. Um, and that's because of the productivity. It's really useful and it's easy for people to use. Um, and that's one of the things we see. And the, the changes, this shows you that Uber has 470 times, not percent, times uh, the trips it had in New York after the same amount of time. That's really fast adoption and can be very disruptive to the people, the humans, uh, in the industry. And um, that's one of the reasons why some industries are short, long, take, take a bit longer. I'm going to do a little bit of a dive into education because we're not taxi drivers here, but we probably use, uh, use those technologies and we download the apps on our phones. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about learning and education and the impact on teachers and student attainment um, because for years people, you know, the nirvana has been it should be, you know, innovation really hard. You can't get into schools. The same thing's happening in schools as happened ever. Um, but you have recently, in the last couple of years, started to see adoption curves like what I just showed for Uber. And that's really interesting. And I'm wondering about the adoption curves that you're seeing in some places in healthcare. And hopefully, I'll turn you all into Sherlock Holmeses, um, and you'll be able to find those. And maybe we'll also be able to set out a program or help you think about what you can do once you've found them to get them adopted everywhere. Um, I just want to talk about, again, uh, in this is education. It's ed tech funding from the world of venture capital. And it shows how much money is being put into uh, funding innovations in this particular sector. Um, and last year, 2014, it showed that there were 1 billion, eight, you know, 1.8 billion put into um, what goes on in our classrooms, which is actually pretty cool. Because if you're the government and you no longer have to fund the things that are being used in the classroom, that's great. Um, but if you're a teacher, you've got 350 new innovations, and which one do you choose? Um, because most of them won't work. Um, so it's how do you find the things that work? You may or may not know that 54% of all venture capital is now going into ed tech. Um, and one of the reasons that that is the case is because you are now seeing the adoption, you're seeing the user cases, you're being able to prove for the first time um, the productivity gains and the out, outcome gains, um, which is, again, this point. So it used to be very slow adoption in schools. Um, and now you're getting an SM is social media, i.e. you can download the apps onto your phone and they're, and they're free at use. You're now seeing amazing teacher productivity, learner attainment for the first time. This is showing teacher productivity and learner attainment. Uh, and just so you can see here the value of apps in helping students learn. Um, and it is now the case that they agree that they are learning more. Um, so imagine that that's a patient outcome or it's nurse, nurse productivity or, or, or doctor productivity. And again, the same thing for the teachers, you're getting the same thing. You're getting neutral 31%, but 54% agree or strongly agree. And when you get that, and when it's a 10x on their productivity, if it took three hours to do something and it's now taking them 20 minutes to prepare and they get the same outcome or a better outcome, that's when you you 
start seeing real momentum in the innovation. And we're seeing that in um, education. And I'm, I'm sure that it must be happening in your, in your world as well. This just goes through it, whether or not you need something that's been created for the classroom by the government or by you know, sort of the government supplier, or if something that's fit for purpose that everybody uses will do. And what this shows is that you're seeing um, teachers, how often they're using online tools created for consumers in other worlds in the classroom. And it's gone down, for, you know, gone up, sorry, to 31% almost every day, 14% every day, occasionally almost never. And Microsoft Word being used a lot. Google Apps didn't even really exist five years ago. Um, Google Classroom, you know, went from nothing again up Google, Google Chrome. This is showing, uh, again, in, in education, you often with millennials or born digital people, you see really fast adoption rates, um, which would be the younger ones. Um, but you're seeing really fast adoption rates in uh, 45 to 60, 60 year olds and a tiny amount of training. It used to be you'd have to go on a training course for a week to learn how to understand something. And now you don't need to go on a training course for that long. In fact, you can watch a 10 minute video and get up to, and get up to speed. Um, and that's pretty interesting. Again, you're seeing the barriers to adoption. There's huge barriers to adoption everywhere on innovation, but those are being systematically torn away. Um, and that produces both opportunities and challenges at the same time. Um, so Edmodo is an interesting example because it's like a Facebook for the world of education. Um, and uh, it's a platform where teachers and students, they collaborate, they share, um, and it's producing exactly what you were hoping. And it's also improving parental engagement. Um, and it is now adopted uh, enor enormously. I'm also going to talk about um, how Founders for Schools is it's using LinkedIn, which is a free uh, a, a free app for teachers to use and also students to use and how it's being used in the classroom to improve uh, student attainment, particularly around STEM adoption. Um, so Edmodo is absolutely trusted by teachers. It helps them do what they've always wanted to do way better and way cheaper. Um, and it's also trusted by the students uh, and the parents love it as well. And that's quite a powerful, potent thing because technology in this case isn't an encumbrance. It helps people do what they wanted to do. Um, so it's free to use. There are huge productivity gains. And we're not talking 10%. We're talking hundreds, hundreds of, you know, diff you know huge different. And parental engagement, it makes them feel. So what you've seen with Edmodo is 35 million users after a not at all period of like three years. Um, and they're using it every day in 220,000 schools. That is really fast adoption. And it's from another industry, but they've just used common technology from other industries and they've adopted it into the schools and it's worked. Um, this here is looking at Founders for Schools and it is using LinkedIn technology to allow teachers to bring business leaders from around their neighborhood into the class to talk about what they do at work. And this is really important because they have an imperative to talk about the future of work and what the future jobs are, but they don't really know what the future jobs are. And the people who are creating the jobs are the ones that they are they <laughs> in, use the, to invite into the program. Um, again, the parents love it because they've been angsting about, you know, the jobs that their you know children have been the guidance that their kids have been not receiving in school, um, and, and and the students love it. It uh, has it's free to use. The time savings it goes down to four minutes to create an event with business leaders in your classroom, down from hours and hours and hours. Um, the learn or STEM attain attainment gains after one session, three times the percentage of children are choosing a STEM subject. This is the number one biggest issue that there's open jobs and the students are not coming out of the system learning STEM. Um, and the massive cost savings to the system, the cost of, if you come out of the system and you're not employable, the cost to make you employable is some, you know, minimum 10,000 pounds per person. If you intervene at age 14, 15, um, you prevent that and it's about 50 pence per, um, per creating someone, making them employable. Um, and that is why you see really fast fast adoption curves in education and why you might see them, or you're probably already seeing them in health. Report um, recap. 
Um, this shows that in 2011, because of the government policies, uh, it became easier to create a company in the United Kingdom than in the US. And what this shows is that we passed per 100,000 of business population, we now create quite a few more companies per 100,000 than they do in the United States. Now that's pretty, pretty good until you look at the next slide and you realize that those companies are not actually employing anybody. So that looks less good. Um, and um, what the, the whole thing talking about the scale up was we can start them and you can have an idea, but having an idea actually doesn't do very much for your economic growth or your jobs or anything else. So we were looking at, well, what happens if you want to create a company that employs you know, 25 people, 50 people, 250 people? What do you need to do to get them to be a large employer? Um, because that has big productivity issues. Um, you've probably heard of some of the issues around the UK having low productivity. This is at the nub, this is at the nub of the productivity issue. Um, a lot of the research that we did, we looked at, um, well, what's the nature of these companies, the small ones, the medium ones, the large ones? And we found out some really interesting things. We found out that the median annual sales of a six-year-old firm in the UK is 23,000 um, pounds. There are not a lot of jobs that you can create on, on that, but you wouldn't know that from the modern press. Um, but it's really bear worth, it, it bears thinking about. Um, now, if we talk about scale up, we're saying the judge is the customer and you're measuring it being a customer having ordered 20% more in year two and in year three. So you've got three data points. You're doing a triangulation of data points. It's no longer saying it's a small company. It's saying, well, actually, if you're not growing, you're shrinking. So we want to look at whether or not a company is growing. Um, and we usually take a three-year a three-year period so that you've got two two trend lines. Um, uh, looking about the uh, one just one percent of all of the companies after six years have more than a million pounds of turnover. Again, really quite surprising because you would imagine that they've all got billions of turnover because you think it's really easy to run a business, but actually it's really quite difficult to run a business. Um, and that's the story about scaling up. We should, if we're, if I, as an investor, I've got a portfolio of things that I invest in and I have new things that I invest in, but most of my money and most of my time goes in making those things that I have invested in previously work and work well. Um, and you can see that, it, we, I showed you Uber, you can see that they have not stood still with their software. They make it better every single day and they ship, they ship, they distribute the new version every single day and they make it easier to use every single day. And that's really, really important. And it's the making it work and focusing and focusing and focusing and focusing again that improves it. Um, this just looks at a longitudinal study of 10 years of businesses having been created and shows the very rapid fall off in them. So in 1998, um, it looks at the 221,000 businesses that were created. And this is before the, the line even went up, almost straight up. Um, after 10 years, there's only 37% of the companies there. Um, and if you look at those that got to at least 10 employees, that takes you down to 4% of the business population. And if you go down to uh, any survivor that achieved at least one year of 20% growth, you're at 2.7% of the original business population. And if you want to talk about scale-ups according to the definition that I just um, talked about, it's 0.5% of the business population. Um, that is a that is a problem. Um, this uh, this talks about if you want to scale things up, and it's in everybody's um, benefit to do so. It takes everybody to make that to make that happen. It takes government. We've already got the great policies. You've got corporates that need to procure from them. You've got media that needs to probably um, celebrate some of these things. You've got advisors that know how to make them grow. Um, you've got entrepreneurs that want to grow, and you've got educators. And we called on all. Elements elements of the society to close that scale up gap. Um, cost of intervention, again, the job created, the collaboration. If you create a collaborative environment that 
embraces all of these elements of the ecosystem, you can drive the cost down to 1 90th of what it costs than any single one of those elements working on their own. So it's probably one of the first times that there's been, there'd been a calculation of what's the benefit of collaboration. And it's not 5x, it's not 10x, it's not 50%, it's 90 times more effective and cheaper if you do something collaboratively. So I'm hoping that you're going to do lots more collaborative things. I just want to show, this is a very complex graph, but I'm going to, um, it talks about the percentage of companies that are static, neither grow nor shrink in the UK, a slower amount of them shrinking, uh, and a slower amount of them growing fast. In a dynamic economy that is innovative, you will see a lot of companies being launched and being shut down. You'll see a far fewer number of companies being static, flatlining, and you'll see a greater number of companies um, growing fast. And if we were to slightly adjust, adjust this by just 1%, the value to our economy would be 225 billion over 10 years. No additional spend. No extra money, just focusing on the allocation of those resources from the companies that, well, currently are flatlining to those that are growing. Um, there's a huge talent shortage, and that creates a productivity that, that contributes to the productivity gap. So in our portfolios, we should look at how many times we're starting something and just assuming it will be OK, and how many times we focus on, instead of just focusing on starting something, what we do to help and the bandwidth we spread we spend on growing them. Um, so in the report, we talked about the evidence gap. You have to be able to spot the companies that are growing. And we don't want panels of judges. What we recommended was looking at the customer orders. Because if they keep on buying more, then it's working. Um, and we don't have to judge that. We can just look at their turnover or their exports. Um, so we said that if uh, we should all examine and coalesce on what is working, how can you tell? The skills gap, the thing when we interviewed all the companies that had grown and said, is it that you're just not ambitious? Or are there barriers that we could remove for you? And the good news is that there are barriers. They are ambitious, and they've been stopped here in their tracks. But we can get rid of those barriers. So the skills, they're finding it awfully difficult. Last year, there were 990,000 open positions that could not be filled. This year, when we measured, there was 1,200,000. The Royal Society is forecasting that that will increase by another million in the next three years. Um, we need to fix that problem with the skills. Um, the leadership capacity gap is um, if you've been growing something as a senior leader for three or four years, you're starting to get tired. Um, you're, it's growing 20, 30, 40% per annum. And there's, there's leadership costs. There's training that you need. But there's hardly any training at all in the UK to help people who are growing their companies this fast. There's lots of help for people who want Dragon's Den. There's lots of business plan competitions. Every university has several of them. But how many universities do you think have specific executive education to help the scale ups <laughs> in their area. Um, not a lot, not enough. And um, maybe, maybe we can all do something about that. The export gap. 10% of the companies in this country export. If you look at Germany and Benelux, it's 60 70%. Their populations are similar. So there are barriers that, cultural barriers and educational barriers that prevent our business leaders from exporting. Um, at business school, we used to call that um, sort of international business development. Um, and th one of the things that universities are doing around the country, which is quite interesting, is pulling together people who know how to export and making them available for the scale-ups in the area. And I dare say you can maybe do that for the scale-ups, the health scale-ups, um, because it's probably, you know, there probably are certain barriers and regulations that make it sensible, and you've probably got enough of them. Finance gap. When I, because of my background, when I started writing this report, I thought I was going to be writing a report about the finance gap. Um, but it's the fifth most important thing. Um, because if you can't get the people to work for your company, or your people who are leading your company have nervous breakdowns because it's really hard, or they can't get customers in other countries, then you don't need the finance. Um, the fin there is a gap in finance in the UK, but um, 
I'm feeling really optimistic that it's well on its way to being to being filled. And I don't think there's anything specific in healthcare um, really that, that is there. And infrastructure, this is for a scale up, the infrastructure, this is not talking about bandwidth, it's talking about shared space and science parks. And I think in some parts of the country, we've got really good infrastructure. But in other parts of the country, you've got companies that are trying to grow from 50 employees to 100 employees to 200 employees, and it's really, really hard. We've seen some really interesting innovations in Singapore and in Colombia and in Milwaukee and in Boston, where the mayors have got together the real estate developers and said, if a company is growing this fast, you're going to let them out of the lease. And we'll help you find other people to go in that space, but you're going to let them out of the lease. Because what's been happening is the real estate people couldn't spot who was scaling. All they heard was that somebody wanted to move out of their space and they said, no, you're in for five years. These people, the rapidly growing companies, then would get little campuses of small bits of their company all over the place and their communication costs would go sky high and their productivity would go sky, would, would go through the floor. Um, and that has been, there's been some innovative you know, things um, in other countries and cities that have that have knocked that on the head, which is quite interesting to watch. Um, I didn't know this before, that um, small and medium-sized businesses create three times as many jobs every week than the FTSE 100. Who would have known? We always hear about the big companies, the little, medium, the little and medium-sized companies don't have a voice. And so one of the things that I've been trying to do uh, with, with scale-ups is give them a voice and helping understand the barriers that there are. They don't have time to lobby the government. They don't have time to even speak for themselves because they're so busy um, helping their customers. So scale-ups are not startups. Catch yourself the next time you say startup. Um, they say, do I mean an idea or do I mean someone who's got an idea that's really been working for three years and that's a different, it's a different issue that they'll be facing at. Um, the ROI and scale-ups have very, very big payoff in terms of economic growth and in terms of removing systemic costs. I spoke about the first two companies that I had. The first one, the cost base of the same outcomes was 1 80th. Um, some of the collaborative efforts from the 20 different countries that we studied when we were pulling the data together uh, showed that if you collaborate, one, you get the cost down to 1 90th. It's phenomenal if you can make it work. So if we are thinking about innovation, let's not just thought it, think about ideas. Let's think about ideas that were there, were there three, four, five, ten 10 years ago, that now you can see the demand working. It takes a long time, particularly in life sciences, to get product market fit, also in education. Um, but once you've got it, it's fabulous. And then it's a rapid rollout, either across NHS Trust or even a pro into different countries. Um, scale ups, you would have thought everything's in London, but um, thankfully, I'm in Cambridge. Um, it's not. The scale-ups are everywhere. About 75% of them are outside of London, um, usually often around a university, which is also helpful. So that's why we thought that part of the solution would be universities putting together um, solutions of very, very flexible executive education. In the old days, universities would say, oh, uh, you come to our three-month executive education course or our month-long executive education course. When you're growing a company this fast, you cannot do that. So what we've seen happen is every six weeks, universities are putting together cohorts and they're pulling in for a set curriculum the things that these leaders need. And it's a two-year program, but it's every six weeks. They come by for a day. They do it. They go back. They run their companies. They come back six weeks later. But it works. And it's producing phenomenal, um, phenomenal results. Um, this just shows something interesting. Um, the Royal Society and the Science Museum did a tracking exercise of their scale-ups that had proper science behind them. Um, and to our surprise, the 50 science-based companies um, were increasing their revenues by 92% per annum. Uh, that's also very difficult as a business leader. Um, but we didn't know that. Um, and so once you start triangulating, not on it's a small company or it's a big company, but it's a growing company, and we found that the science-based ones were growing faster than most companies, that makes it even more interesting. We haven't done a health science type one, but we could because we've got all the data. All the data exists. The fabulous thing about being here in the UK is the government has been collecting data for a very long time. So if you know what you're looking for, you can run the algorithm that can tell you what 
what, um, what that is. We'd need some help to be able to figure out how to tell a science, you know, from a science based one. So this was literally the scientist said, that's one of ours, that's proper science. And they sort of t took the list and then we added it up. But that's very interesting. So provocations for health, because I do apologize, I don't know very much at all about your industry, um, is the level of Coke, and I just, so I went, of course, onto the internet and used Google to come up with a few things. Um, and it would seem that um, you don't think you're doing that much innovative, you know, co-creating things with others. And it's really important to co-create things with others. It wipes out the costs, the productivity goes out, and your outcomes are phenomenal. So if there's anything that I could encourage you to do as a foundation that has to encourage co-creation and collaboration, I think um, I, would, I would encourage you to do it. Um, I know it's important, but you know it's going to be important in the future as well. Um, this was just looking, I, I had talked earlier about the money going into ed tech, so I looked a little bit at what was going into health tech. There's quite a lot of other people's money going into your area, so I'd let them experiment, um, but I would make sure that anything that you endorsed, you made sure worked. 95% um, of the experiments going on probably won't work, and that's okay. We're scientists. Um, you know, learning from failure and learning from testing hypothesis is exactly what, what we should do. As, a, as an investor, I've got a lot of investments. I don't expect them all to work. I'm almost testing hypothesis hypothesis when I do that. But once something starts working, that's when you need to focus on getting it there and there and there. And then as they have growing pains, making sure they get executive education at the right time. And if they want to export, they can get that too. Um, so um, I'm wondering about where it is that you're getting doctor productivity, and again, naive way of describing your industry for which I apologize. You know, where are you getting the doctor productivity? And is it junior, you know, is it junior doctor or or is it consultant? What about nurse productivity? Um, what about administrators? What are the tools that are bubbling up elsewhere right now in the UK that are giving you this phenomenal productivity gains? I don't know what they are, but I feel like you know, if I were Sherlock Holmes and I you know were on that mission, I might think about that. And patient incomes, sorry, not incomes, outcomes. Um, <laughs> you don't really care about the incomes at all. You should not care about the incomes. Um, I was thinking about um, LinkedIn the other day day and they had their annual conference and they invited their customers who use their services and I asked the question of well who's here and was told that it was their broad, it was their large corporate customers and that on average in order to gain an invitation to the annual event which was at the Queen Elizabeth Center the minimum cost savings was a million pounds it cost 7000 pounds per seat to use this thing and the minimum per you know the minimum gain was a million pounds um, and it's free to use and it, and it works. So what I don't know is whether or not you're using these free social media like tools to lower, to give yourself productivity gains um, and, and the patient outcomes. Um, I was interviewing some people who work for the NHS who were using WhatsApp in Tanzania to consult with people that they had known and worked with for years while they encountered things that they were unfamiliar with to make them feel confident of a diagnosis. And they said, well, when we're, you know, we're not allowed to use this when we're in the hospital, but when we're out in the field in Tanzania, we're allowed to use it and we use it because it means that we're more sure about what we do. You, I, I, you should be watching those things and seeing, you know, well, if that's what works, then you know, you know, you get the patient outcomes. You improve the confidence of the doctors. It's a good thing. Something I know a little bit is IESO, which is a CBT therapy, uh, and I, it's not free to use, um, but I like it because it used to be that it was um, the, it, it took ten times before somebody had this therapy before they were cured, and now it's five. But what I really liked about it is that the psychologists um, used to only be able to see two or three people in a day and they can now see six or seven because this is online so their incomes have gone through the roof the outcomes of their patients are vastly improved um, and as I understand it the waiting lists are, are decreasing and, and I should say I have invested in this thing um, but I do like it because it had the productivity gains that we were looking that we were looking for um, so that's it. So start thinking about, you know, if I had, a, you know, ideas, it's where are 
you know, where's the impact? Where are you getting either the productivity gains or the, the outcomes? Um, I don't know where that is. You, sh you encourage lots of people to take experiments within reason. Um, and when you see the thing working, I would make sure you had a team on thinking hard about what do we need to do to get them everywhere? Because if they're getting the outcomes and they're making easier for your professionals to do their jobs, we want to get it everywhere. But the people who have created whatever that little innovation is, they need help because it's really, really hard. You saw the, it's really hard, easy to start something. It's really hard to keep on growing it year after year. And that's where I would call upon the universities to use their convening power from industry and from people who have done it before um, and then scale the high impact so that's that um, release data on innovations or at least track it um, top 50 innovations productivity patient outcomes intervention NHS and then there are a few things but I would turn to some universities to take a lead in health um, so that those who have health and then you could ask the UK you could ask UKTI to have trade missions to bring other people again you don't need extra money you need an allocation of very scarce resources to these companies that are doing quite extraordinary things that make the whole <laughs> system better um, and that's a good thing. And, that's, and the champion success stories. The other one thing about British people is you're all, and I can say this as a Canadian, I'm not an obnoxious American um, or, or a loud American. In Britain, we don't stand up and say, we are really great. Um, and people, particularly in health and life sciences, don't do that. And one of the things that we could do for those people who do have the innovations is champion it for them and allow them to get, to get the message out. Because there is a cultural bias towards you know boasting uh, and that's a good thing because it's horrible to boast um, but if something's working we should help them get it out because it helps them and more importantly it helps us and it helps our children and our grandchildren and what we're all trying to achieve together anyway with that I will stop babbling thank you very much thanks So thank, thank you, Sherry. And uh, we now have time for a few questions. And I'm going to pick up a tablet because there are some people at home, or I assume they're at home, or by the still highly productive in their offices who are going to be asking some questions online, which I'll look here at. Too. <laughs> Sorry? But there's people here too. There are people here too, exactly. No, I'll come to them first because okay. they, they are the, the humans when I've worked out how to switch this on, obviously. There we are. Uh, <laughs> so um, thank you so much for that uh, run through. I, I mean, I think there was lots of uh, food for thought there. I mean, if, if I can start off really simply, um, there's one way of looking at what you said it, it is really useful thinking about how to grow companies outside of the health, the NHS, just let's, let's just take the NHS. And, uh, you know, if you are a Clayton Christian type, you will say the best disruption will come from external um, to the NHS. So that's one family of things we could ask questions about how best to grow that. There's another set of questions, which is to say we have a health system. We've got lots of um, semi, semi autonomous um, trusts inside and other providers. How do we best scale up things within a system that's more like a federation? So I wondered, my, I mean, I'll turn to you in a minute, but my first question would be, uh, have you got any experience of things like a national health system, the National Health Service, where it's not like a, a bunch of autonomous organizations competing as in the outside world, it is, nor is it a one, you know, a straight jacketed one system. It's a kind of, well, it's a, it's a kind of federation, if you like, isn't it? It's, it's, uh, but it's more of a system than it is a, certainly a free market. Yeah. So, under those circumstances, have you got much experience of how spread can be supported in that kind of setting? Yes. Um, so, and I think I would draw on the, the healthcare, but I would also draw on the IESO, um, which is a CBT. So those were co-created by people inside the system. So I know you mentioned Clay, Clayton Christensen, who I'm a huge fan of. Um, 
but I am more familiar with things that have been created from within the system because it's the ecosystem and it's somebody who wants to solve a problem that they're really passionate about and they don't accept the status quo and they find a new way a new way of doing it um, and I think there's lots of examples of that there's um, and I know that sort of in the industry where you come from you know it, it's not a federation there is competition but when you get the adoption like that it means that you've got something that works that means the customers love it and their normal barriers to adopting something else drop away because the innovation has been so profound that it's not 10x it's you know you get down to it's not a 50% when I invest in things I never invest in things if there's like a 50% increment it has to go down to at least a tenth or lower so it has to you have to get an order of magnitude better product to outcome for the patients and technology and business model change allows us to do that so Clayton Christensen if you haven't uh, I would recommend that you read his his work uh, it's wonderful to, to read it is wonderful he talks about three different types of innovation some innovation is about reducing the cost um, and some innovation is about changing the business model which means you still you're focusing the outcome like a laser beam you want that outcome and you don't accept the way the current system delivers that outcome and you come up with something new and that something new can usually be delivered at you know one one hundred of the cost and that's the the business model the, the business model innovation and that's the one to go go for when he was at Oxford doing his secondment a couple uh, no, it's not called a secondment what is it called um sabbatical sabbatical yes mm -hmm. uh, he was doing a sabbatical at Oxford a couple of years ago and he gave a lecture at um, at the LSE and he was talking about the jobs and the growth and the innovation really only comes from focusing on the outcome that we all know we want but working hard at delivering it through different processes and I think that's very exciting and I think that you'll get that from your doctors and nurses. You'll get it from those you know, NHS doctors who are in Tanzania using WhatsApp to consult with their friends that happen to be in America because they've met something that they're not sure about. That's a wonderful use of the technology. It gets a better outcome. It makes the, the physician comfortable about what they're doing. Um, which is all you want, and they didn't have to pay for it because it's part of Facebook, um, and they were using it in another, you know, in another life, another world. And they just thought, oh, I can consult with that person. I know I'm connected to them. So that's an innovation, and I think it, that you've got that bubbling up from the bottom. You know, you, you, you've, the wonderful thing here is you want the outcomes, and you've got dedicated, great people. Um, however, it's harder if you're inside the system and you're inexperienced, to uh, in a commercial sense or a scientific translation sense it's harder and that's why the support for those that are having these experiments to grow them is even more important because you could come fly in from outside the industry like me but I won't understand the industry and I might you know suggest something absurd it's probably better to take a commercial person and attach them in some way to someone who has a real innovation and help them grow it and scale it throughout the system usually you scale scale either within a hospital maybe different departments or uh, and this is this is how you do it in schools and other industries anyway you either scale deeper within an organization or you take a small product and you get that into a bunch of other places both of them work um, uh, but they require slightly different skill sets and people who understand those tools can come in and assist and coach and mentor the the people who have found those innovations and it's very specialist commercialization of of you know the translation of science that's what we're talking about um, but those people who know how to do that are quite aware we just need to find out where they are and plot them into the right person at the right time but which of the 350 things should they be pointed at and that's where I think the ecosystem can help say we think this is really good and that can help get the talent the very rare talent into the right place because you might have a, an amazing person who can help you know 
anyone translate or commercialize anything working on something that has bad science with it or that really doesn't work or that the doctors hate or the nurses hate or it causes somebody to go into a corner and you know not talk to patients any longer but a way of surfacing the things that are working that the ecosystem thinks works I think um, is is really important and you can do that but it's a way of surfacing it and making them feel safe in saying I've got this innovation and I think it's working get some peer review make sure it works make sure it's not going to hurt people because there are serious implications to adopting new techniques in health that I don't understand that I'd be quite frightened of as a, a you know as an investor but if that works then you can get them you can help them but assuming our mistake in the UK has been in tech anyway maybe not in health it has been assuming once the idea has worked in one place super simple it'll just automatically happen elsewhere it's blisteringly hard and there are human frailties and emotions and difficulties at, at making that work and they're the same every time you grow a company from 25 to 50 to 100 um, and you just need to help you know people who've done it before get them in the right place at the right time and it's very scarce resources so allocating those scarce resources to those that will create the biggest benefit um, can be done. So there are big questions there, which I think we'll come on to perhaps later, which is about supporting the kind of spread of, of innovation. I mean, you mentioned well, supporting the leaders so they can the spread it. It's Excellent. all people who run businesses. It's not people talk about businesses as inanimate things. Pe they're agglomerations of humans yes. that want to get something done. Yes. And they are frail, just like you and I. They've got kids at home and you know they've got mothers and everything else and it's hard when you're when you're on that journey and it's supporting them on that journey and recognizing that the innovation that they're trying to bring about is worth supporting them on and not just assuming that oh, it'll be easy you're like another Mark Zuckerberg it'll just be it'll just happen you know it, it's not it's not simple and it's recognizing that as a system and helping just a last quick question from me before I turn to the audience your report mentioned some very um, you know important and I suppose fairly um, obvious basic points about how to support innovation um, what's been the response to government because some of these things are not short-term uh, issues are they which you know which governments rather like they're rather long-term sort of building blocks for something a, a, to build an ecosystem as you say so what's the, the response that uh, that you have found since your report was published uh, I've been amazed by the response and so if uh, in the recommendations I also made the point that some of them well it was a report written for the government but for the ecosystem there were recommendations of things that definitely weren't for the government and there were recommendations to the government so one of them was specifically that UKTI which is the UK trade and investment which is an organization that helps um, companies with exports that they changed their trade missions to focus on companies that were scaling up rather than companies that had idea ideas or rather than the large companies and they are now doing that um, it's brilliant. Um, Innovate UK, which is the um, innovation arm of, uh, of biz, um, four, they've got a five-prong um, strategy, and four of them are around scale-ups. So the triangulation of the data and the movement from looking at a SME, which is a static measure, to a trend measure mm -hmm. seems to have been, I think that's been adopted. The release of information is slightly, is slightly harder. Um, the creation of tools so that you can identify scale-ups has been done, which is great. Um, that has been done. You can find every single scale-up in the UK right now. It's fabulous. Um, the adoption of the creation of tools for schools so that teachers can find them and they can get the innovative companies into their classrooms, that's done, um, which is great. Department for Education is a little bit harder, so there is... Um, uh, try with there we've advocated the release of new data and the release of new data that has never been released before is slightly trickier but I think we're making I think we're making progress um, and we'll see we'll see how that goes um, and there is also there was the recommendation of 
releasing the company's house data that we go on, that we use at the moment so that you can identify scale ups is about a year and a half, a year to a year and a half out of date, which is fine for teachers, but it's not so fine for the allocation of finance or for highlighting a scale up leader just as they start to scale up to offer them the help. So right now we're able to use the data that's a little bit out of date and we've recommended shifting the release of the data that information and you know it, I, it, it's it's not simple because you've got it's not simple but I think progress is being made um, so I've been really encouraged by it the low-hanging fruit on the finance I think you've seen you've seen the British Business Bank you've seen the Bitters Growth Fund you've seen 10 at least 10 billion pound firms uh, sorry funds be created in the last 14 months all of them have um, focused on the scale-up report as the reason they were setting up their fund um, so I think the follow-on gap that there was at the time is much, much less pronounced. The skills is the one that I'm very concerned about, that we haven't seen enough of a move on. 92% of the openings are in STEM. We haven't cracked the STEM issue. Um, and I don't know yet how to crack that one, but it's worth, you know, it's really important. It's our children, it's our grandchildren, so we will crack that one. Um, but I've been amazed. I've been, the support that the government has in this country for entrepreneurship is phenomenal. I think they love the idea of the collaboration because it's a lot cheaper to get the same outcomes. And I think they've been encouraged by some of the things that they've seen. Is there more that can be done? Yes, there's a lot more that can be done. Has it happened fast enough? I'm an entrepreneur, nothing ever happens fast enough. Um, but I've been encouraged and, and uh, I think it's been really warmly received. There are nine other countries. So I was asked to go present this to Obama's team. Um, you know, there are nine other countries that have adopted this and put together task force to push this through their system because it's an unusual way of the systemic look mm -hmm. at an economy is an, it's an unusual way of looking at an, econ an, an, at an economy um, but it seems to have caught on in, in, in many ways. Great, good, thank you. So now we have a chance for some questions perhaps either on the um, business side or indeed within the health system side that people might be interested to ask. Yes, thank you. If you could say who you are and uh, there's a mic coming. Thank you. Hello, can you hear that? I can. Uh, I'll, re I'll repeat it. I can you're hear you. Okay. Uh, my name is Dan Borelovitz. I'm the uh, founder and chief exec of the Centre for Social Franchising. We're um, helping a number of health organisations in the UK and globally scale up. And um, so I, I guess I'm, you know, yeah. really interested in what's being seen in the in the commercial sector. One of the uh, key challenges, I think, is that obviously tech solutions have this potential for 10x, 100x, uh, you know, and very disruptive of change but actually within the health sector we've got very uh, complex and you know systems that have been developed for years and years with lots of vested and difficult interests and a lot of what we're trying to do is just gradually improve uh, and scale up improvements but then when you say adoption is very difficult without 10x or more improvement that's sort of slightly disheartening I guess so what's the difference between the sort of more tech uh, pure tech, sort of Uber type disruptive innovations and maybe te tech enabled innovations and how do you see those sort of innovations scaling? So um, I think the tech enabled solutions probably account for 25, maybe less than 25% of that 225 billion. Um, so it doesn't lie in tech. The change goes on the Clayton Christensen changing the business process so that the outcomes are different. And that doesn't, that's not tech, that's innovation. And that's someone wanting to solve a problem and not accepting that the current industry structure for delivering that or the current processes for delivering that are, are acceptable or necessary any longer. So um, you don't need tech. tech. It does happen quickly with tech in some cases, but those and Uber, it, again, it was rethinking a way uh, transport in an industry. You know, the, the business model change is more profound than than um, than the, the tech. Um, and it's that people in many, you know, China, they don't, you know, have their car, they don't have cars anymore. They just order a car. 
every time I order a taxi, I get very annoyed. I live in a very out of the way place and taxis can't find me. Um, if I could somehow have them beam on to my house and get to, you know, get to me the right place, um, that would be useful. So most of it isn't in tech. It was the science-based ones we, that we looked at. Um, doesn't have to do with tech. It's got to do with new, real science. Some of the most interesting things are going on in, in, in Aberdeen, um, where there's amazing chemist, you know, chemistry and sort of physics. The really interesting things, I think, are going to come from pure science, um, because that's where we're making the discoveries. And if you can understand that, and you've still got a problem you want to solve, it's that application of the new discovery to an old problem, to the benefit of the system, that will create the most profound differences here that will benefit benefit society. It's not pure tech. I'm sorry if I sounded like I was overestimating the tech part of it. Um, I was using it to illustrate, you know, the uh, illustrate how the adoption how the adoption is. It's processes changing that create the real change, and I hope that you're seeing some of those in your in your organization. I'd be m much more excited about business process and a business model flip um, than than just a new than just a technology. Thank you. Helen. Um, I thought that was a fantastic talk, um, really stimulating. So what was interesting to me was, um, oh, I better say who I am. I'm Helen Bevan and I work for the Horizons team, which is part of um, NHS England. <laughs> so um, Sherry, when you started, like the definitions that you were using around um, scaling up and what you were talking about was at an enterprise level and you defined a scale up as a particular kind of enterprise in a particular context. And then um, as we've kind of got further into the talk and you were talking about the specifics in our um, health and care system, a lot of the time we were talking about scale up of specific um, uh, innovations. And it's interesting because if we look at the actual kind of program that we've, we, um, we've got here, you know, and the, the framing from the Health Foundation, it's about spreading innovation and improvement. So the kind of thing that's going on in my head and the question is what's the relationship between um, the definition of scale up at the level of an enterprise versus um, scale up in terms of spreading innovation and improvement and specific um, innovations and where, how do the two fit together? Okay. Um... So the scaling in of an innovation, so at a company level, um, for a company to scale, it probably has a whole bunch of innovations. And there are different streams, different products or different services that together can get grouped into a, a legal entity. Um, I think innovations in a system are, are no different. They have someone who's found a new way of doing something. There's an acceptance by peers um, and the users of that that it works and um, some verification. And the verification is really, really important. Um, and then you've got a question of who else needs this? If this isn't entirely isolated, then who else needs this? Is it somebody in a different department in the hospital? in which case maybe with an administrative tool it would be or is it something like that in a different NHS trust and you still have the person who created it needing to think about how you create a sustainable model for having it adopted in another place sometimes it's licensing uh, a technology Sometimes, or, and sometimes it's licensing a technology and doing some training. Sometimes it's licensing training and some incentives for the adoption in order to get the, the cost benefits. And the, the commercialization person that I was talking about will help figure out whether or not you need one or two or, or three of those to create it, it sustain, to make it sustainable. Um, it's still a person who's had an idea and got what we call product market fit. So it worked, woo, and sometimes it takes a long, long time to make something work, years. Um, one of the, in the definition that we used, we used the OECD. Um, it was very dangerous. Some policymakers were thinking that just young companies were good. So you went to a huge swing towards, oh, we're just gonna help young companies. You know, there was the 100% net new jobs coming from companies less than five years old. That all, that was not, a, that, the knee-jerk reaction to that is only focusing on everything that's young but particularly for life sciences that take 
years or in clean energy where you know some of the you know where you've got chemics you know chemistry or physics involved it takes a long time before you can show that it works um, but you've got you know an innovator that innovator will need support um, they can work alone for a long time before they get it working with small grants here and there. But to make it go to another hospital or 500 other hospitals, that's a little, you know, it, you know, is it licensing? Is it create training? What do you need to do? And working out, well, if it is training, is it a day's training? Is it two weeks training? Um, if it's licensing it, what do you charge the light? What's the, what should the license fee be? Should it be a not-for-profit? Should be a should it be a for-profit? You know, should it you know what you know if it came from a university hospital, who owns the IP? So those are commercialization translation questions that there are experts. You know, you don't need them at every hospital, but there are some experts that can help answer those questions. Um, and once they're answered, it becomes easy to get it into other places. Is in the venture capital world, you get, you know, what a venture capitalist is a translation expert. They go from experiment to some call it blitz scaling. In the US, they call it blitz scaling. I hate the word, um, but they call it blitz scaling because they want to go from idea, proving that it works, getting it verified to absolutely everywhere. You know, Uber has scaled up, they rate, you know, hundreds of millions of pounds and they're scaling out simultaneously in a lot of cities because they've got something that works and they don't want to get anybody else in. Um, and the economies of scale that they're getting are phenomenal. And it's a for-profit company, but the benefit to the economy of, uh, of, of the Uber, you know, is, is, you know, is also huge. I don't know if I answered your question, but um, but it's people, innovations, very specialist talents for translating that, and it's that translation, getting, making sure that the translators don't spend time with the bad science or the bad innovation, the innovation that doesn't work, because it's very, you know, they're quite rare. So I think the system could provide pointers to the things that look like they're gonna they're gonna work. That's what we do in other industries. We try to get ways of telling that it's working. Okay, we've got several questions uh, lined up, so. So perhaps you'd like to ask, and then the lady there, and then James at the back. Did you have? Yeah. Um, this is more of a comment, and I hope it's not a completely na naive one. My involvement with Q um, is as or the Health Foundation through the Q project is as a cared for person in the system. So I'm here as a patient. And one of the things I was particularly excited to hear you say again and again is the phrase your industry and your product. Because I think the thing that often dogs healthcare in this country is that people forget that they are delivering a product and that they have a customer for that product. And on several of your slides, you, you mention patient outcomes. And I think one of the things that is glaringly missing are ways in which people assess the product, i.e. the outcome from the, the person's perspective, and that there is a lot of scope for innovation there. Okay, can, can we just the, bring uh, in two other questions and then we'll take them all three together. So just a comment on that. The, um, the Edmodo and some of the others, I mentioned that they were co-created by the person who had the outcome and the person who was delivering the outcome. I think the co-creation is really, really critical. Okay, yep. Hello, um, Amanda Begley from UCL Partners, and um, I had the pleasure of working with the Health Foundation NHS England on the NHS Innovation Accelerator Programme, which is supporting fantastic entrepreneurs to take innovation and scale it more rapidly across the NHS. Um, in conversations with NHS colleagues, the things they are sort of saying they struggle with is lots of people trying to sell them things constantly um, and not necessarily knowing what's the most efficient mechanism for horizon scanning, selecting great innovations, and then having the capability and capacity to implement them. So I was just quite struck by your suggestion of identifying the top 50 innovations um, and our track record thus far of being extremely poor on how best, most efficiently and effective to identify the most high impact innovations for the system to address the needs that matter most to them. Just uh, you, you, get that in other, other I think you get you get that in other industries as well. Um, if I look at the investment world, you've got investment committees that look at um, whether or not it's working. 
um, and those are people looking at it. Um, one of the things, one of their criterions, their key performance is looking at how fast it's been adopted by patients, um, or not by patients, because it's not usually the, the health. Um, and I, I think that getting groups of knowledgeable people comprised of patients, you know, everybody in the ecosystem, the collaboration, uh, and agreeing on those that should be encouraged is really important. I think that endorsing the things that are working, so if I go back to the Scale Up Institute, um, there were t 10 applications for every one that our evidence and investment committee endorsed. And you know that's just the way it was. And those that didn't get endorsed weren't told they had a bad product. It's that they weren't able to produce evidence that was convincing. It didn't mean that they didn't have the opportunity to come back and present evidence that would be convincing. And many of them are doing so now. Um, I think being evidence-driven is really, really important for all of us. I, I mentioned the EdTech. There's 351 companies that absorb two billion. The teachers are very confused, just as I imagine the doctors and nurses are also very confused. So one of the real services that I think the ecosystem can do is highlighting, maybe it's five. And you know, I said 50. Maybe it's the top 10 in productivity gains are this. And you just help get those out. Or the top 10 for patient outcomes are this. Um, and I think you can start to whittle down the, the different types of innovation that you're going for. Um, it could be you know the cost of outcome you know the cost per patient goes from the 10 you know the reason we know those answers is because we're measuring it we know that if you intervene then it costs you 10,000 quid and if you intervene six years before with the same person it costs 50 pence that's really important information to have and we as a, a system should be monitoring and looking at the evidence I'd form an evidence and investment committee and I think about it investing and it's who do you endorse because it you know in other industries they're frozen from being a frozen from action because they don't know what works um, if there is a entity that can help and set up a process for properly evidencing uh, and not turning away innovation is saying it's not enough evidence but if you can produce that we're on we're on for it and it just turns you know we do it we've done an investment forever it's like well you know you know you haven't shown us this thing but you can show us that come back and you know come back when you've done that and that doesn't mean you've slammed innovation it means that you've given them a hint about what one of their key parameters that they should be looking for when you've got um, inexperienced individuals putting in place these frameworks for evidence allows them it teaches um, teaches people about the right sort of evidence that they should be looking for themselves and once you tell them that's what we're looking for they go oh well, of course you are and then they go and get it it's good Okay, we've got time for one last question because uh, wine is beckoning. I think to James. To James. I, um, oh no. Okay. To, okay two quick ones then. Very quick. Yeah. Thank you. The lady in stripes had a question too. She yes. The lady. Lady here. Yeah. Okay. Hi. So I'm, I don't know if this is on actually. I'm James. Yes, Butler, it's on. It's um, on. From uh, UCL Partners and from the Royal Free. And uh, I mean, it's absolutely fascinating. My mind is whirring. Um, <laughs> perhaps uh, as a as a simple uh, question as we close. If you uh, look globally at health. Uh, and healthcare. Are there some characteristics of ways of organizing in healthcare or health systems that you've seen around the world that are better at this sort of, of thing? And where would you look um, for, for ideas? Hmm. Um, I've seen some really interesting. Um, there's the uh, guy called Daniel Kraft at Singularity University. I don't know if you've seen some of the stuff that they're doing, but it's fascinating. And if you haven't looked at the health initiative at Singularity, I'd take a look at it. Um, Obama last week was talking about their um, uh, exponential medicine. So I, I I think there's some interesting things going on in the States. Um, and if you haven't met or don't know Daniel Kraft, I'd look at that. There's another woman called um, Catherine Moore, M-O-H-R, who's a Kiwi, who has some very interesting ways of thinking about innovation in healthcare, but it's really not my area. I'm so much an outsider. You'd be able to identify a person better better than me. But they, there's, there's some really good people on the planet that are thinking hard about this. And 
I'd ask them to come and talk to you because I suspect that they'd be delighted. One of the things I love about the, the UK is you have huge data sets, massive ones. If you go to the state, they're all in little states and little health systems. You can't get your hands on it. You're, the ability that you could do, you could use data analysis for your reverse cohort analysis. Oh, as a data scientist, I just get very excited about what you could see, this, the patterns that you could spot here because you've got the data is phenomenal. So um, yeah, um, anyway, you've so got an amazing treasure trove here. Thank you. And the last question here with the lady in the striped t-shirt. You can wait in the back. Thank you. Uh, my name's Sarah Gillinson. I lead an organization called Innovation Unit, and we help uh, public services to develop and embed and to scale different better and lower cost public services. And couldn't agree more with the focus on supporting people to grow as being the incredibly difficult thing. And I suppose my question in helping, in our experience of helping people to develop the radically different services that we're talking about, is whether there's something slightly different about scaling up what I think in lots of the examples you were describing are ways in which people are helping um, public services in our instance to do things um, to do better the things they are already doing so innovations that help people and teachers in the classroom to give better careers advice or to teach better the subjects they're already doing versus those innovations that actually ask those public services a different question of what it is they should be doing in the first place the schools in the states for example um, that are that are, are saying okay uh, if we want to help young people to contribute really fantastically to the economy in future we really need to question what schools are for and what it is that teachers do and the when you're into those kinds of innovations the challenge of scale up feels like it becomes something slightly different because not only are you produced are you producing a really interesting answer or product or whatever it is you're asking people quite fundamentally to question what it is they're doing in the first place and i just wonder if there's something slightly different when you're really in that radical space um, that's about creating the case for a new way of doing things as well as just offering up something that helps people to do their job better I think it's almost a spectrum. I mean, you've got to have some people who are working on the fundamentals, let's call it the pure science, which may be the, what is a school for? Um, but we've also got the continual improvement and we as people who are in the system, so people often ask about, you know, entrepreneur and entrepreneur. And I love the definition from Howard Stevenson that defines an entrepreneur as somebody who leverages resources that they do not control to achieve a joint mission. And that makes all of us entrepreneurs and it turns entrepreneurship being a thing that a crazy person does to something that we all aspire to doing because we all want to do um, you know often we want to have we have a shared goal and it's a what's a better way of doing that and that's something that we all do every single day it's like oh there's probably a better way of doing that well let's embrace that better way of doing it there's also the you know, I think of some of the things about climate change. There are some really hard issues that won't get solved unless we have a fundamental application of science and find a new way of doing it. And there's some health issues that won't get solved without creating absolutely new ways of doing it. So the real, the you know, the basic research that goes on at you know, let's say CRUK or some of the other things that you're that you're doing. I'm more familiar with CRUK. I'm sorry. Um, is you know you don't know what's going to work but you do know it's going to take years before you know and that's really important and we shouldn't stop that for a second but <laughs> once it works it's getting getting it out um, and if it needs to be commercialized to operate in all the hospitals do that um, you might ask yourself if it you know if once you've got it adopted throughout the UK whether or not you should stop or keep on going country after country after country after country you know I think if it works here and if it yields people here or the process is better here we should think about getting it in lots of places Reid Hoffman five years ago said that he felt that the first trillion pound company would come from the UK because of the data sets that you hold here um, which is very interesting um, not if you only allowed that data set to operate here, but if the, some of those pattern recognitions and the things that you learned could be applied to other other places, then you could have a phenomenal, you know, you know, we could have 10 of them. Um, but it's quite interesting. Um, and yeah, where, where you can go is really interesting. I think you've got some fundamental things. You've got some short-term things. I would want to improve things in every single hospital 
every day because it, you know we're all happier when we're work, when we're adjusting things and when we when we feel empowered to make improvements and sometimes you don't know if your improvements is going to change the world or if it's just going to change your ward um, but it's better to feel that you've made progress I think you know on some moral human basis I think there's a you know a need to feel that it's better every day or every week and that you feel empowered to make a suggestion and know that it's it's been worked on it's great if everybody adopts it that's the best you know that's good and if there are barriers that stop us from sharing our progress then we should rip those barriers out of the way get rid of them Sherry, I think you've been very provocative. Thank you very much for giving your views. It's, it's very, healthcare is often a very close shot. We often don't hear people from outside coming to uh, uh, give her their insights. So I think you've give, definitely given us some tonight. Uh, everyone will take their own away. My particular ones were, uh, apart from the obvious potential there is inside our health system, uh, the idea of having the panel of uh, maybe starting with the top 50 sounds a very interesting uh, and very basic way forward. Uh, I think you've opened our eyes to um, the power of using existing applications, the ones that we all use at the moment, uh, to enliven all of our work. Well, there are 1.3 million employees in the National Health Service at the moment, all of whom will be using these things, or most. So I think that's message number two. And the message number three is really back to the same old territory, that uh, some of the things in your scaling up report are absolutely necessary inside the health system. Leadership, skills, finance, infrastructure, they do help create a uh, conducive environment for spread and take up. So I think those are the things I've taken away today, uh, as well as a, a list of links to look up. Thank, thank you for your talk. Um, so many thanks and thank you.